Hi, I'm Sherilyn Fenn, and you're listening to Twin Peaks Unwrapped. I've got idea, man. You take me for a walk under the sycamore tree. The dark tree that blow, baby, in the dark trees that blow. Welcome to this week's edition of Twin Peaks Unwrapped. I'm your host, Brian Kazaska, and beside me is Ben Durant. Hello, Ben. How are you? I'm great. Another week of Twin Peaks. I felt gypped because I only got an hour. Yeah. You know, I've been spoiled. We got spoiled, spoiled with these two-hour uh, blocks, and now I'm going to get a, one hour. Mm, I don't know how I feel about this. Yes. Because, you know, that middle part, Starts revving up to the next part. Now we get credits. I almost feel like this. Maybe they, when they first edited this, they were thinking of doing nine parts, nine two-hour parts. Because at least there's been a pattern. Like the first two parts seemed like they went together, and I felt like the second two parts went together. And this one just it kind of ends where we're we don't go back to the Roadhouse. We've we've got a, a scene happening and the credits. I wouldn't be surprised if next week we don't go back to the Roadhouse at the end. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I feel like oh, we need to see this other part. <laughs> I know they they really have trained us. Showtime uh, and David Lynch and Mark Frost have doling out this drug of Twin Peaks, mm. and then you're Jones in for it. I can't get enough. You can't get enough. <laughs> so I need to borrow some money from Shelly. <laughs> I need twelve dollars from James. <laughs> James, I think Shelly's got the money. I, she sure does. <laughs> <Yeah>. Eighty-one dollars. <laughs> um, was that or seventy? Seventy, seventy-one dollars. So whatever it was, <laughs> something. But but we got a big show. Yeah, we do. Two guests. We've got someone from the new series and somebody from the old series. We've got Jeffrey Gould. He is uh, was in the uh, the first part of the new Twin Peaks, and then we've got Galen George, who played Nancy in the old series. And that interview is amazing, super sweet. Uh, both of them, thank you for being on the show. So we're on the phone with Jeffrey Gould. How are you, Jeffrey? Doing well. So you were on the new Twin Peaks uh, series as a forensic photographer. What was your experience being part of Twin Peaks? Uh, it was it was very cool to be on Twin Peaks. I thought it was really neat. Uh, it was kind of amusing that, as with a lot of uh, shoots, the information that somebody who is working is given is like, here's where crew parking is. They don't say, here's where, you, you know, the base camp is, where you can check, where you're going to check in. They just say, well, here's where everyone's parking. I'm like, well, yeah, but I, I go by bus, so no big deal. I went all the way up to Hollywood Boulevard to a building, classic old uh, ballroom buildings uh, that they rent out their parking lot for space. And there was a shuttle that took me to the uh, location, which was literally within like a half mile of where I live. And I was like, <laughs> okay, yeah, that's not the first time that's happened. We all knew the location was Melody Ranch because a lot of us went up there for wardrobe fittings mm. uh, before the shoot. So here, you know, we'd, we'd park it and then be shuttled over to uh, the ranch from there, which was good because I found some of the carpool with because uh, otherwise I wouldn't have been able to get there as early as they wanted me and, uh, such like that. Yeah. So you are you were considered a featured background. Yeah. And you didn't have to do auditions. Can you tell me what, what the process like that is for, for getting a part like that? Well, with background, depending on who's casting a show, the first thing any person who's going to, you know, start with background uh, or even continue with it, because there are people who aren't actors who literally all they do is background and mm -hmm. they have no problem that they have no interest in becoming an actor. I have an actor who does background as opposed to just a background actor. Hmm. So people sign up at Central Casting, uh, Rich King Casting, uh, Bill Gans, Christopher Gray, uh, all of these different casting companies that are hired out by productions to cast their films, usually background. A lot of people don't have the time or resources 
to call these places every few minutes, eight hours a day. Mm. So what they do is they do what I do is uh, get what's called a calling service for a, a flat rate a month. Usually it averages about $60. That's how much I've used it. A wonderful little place called Book Talent. And they submit all of their clients to different things that people will fit and uh, Crystal Gray and Bill Dance and Rich King and Jeff Allen and all that. And if they come back saying, okay, we like these people because of their looks, will book them. Hmm. And then on the, the night before, they'll call that person and say, okay, you're booked tomorrow on such and such. And in this particular case, there's also LA Casting, which is an online service that gives sort of breakdowns indicating what projects are out there, including mostly background for either major motion pictures or TV shows. The more principal roles usually go out to agents and such like that. And I have a commercial agent, but I don't have a TV theatrical agent. Although my commercial agent did send me down to the practice where I had a day player role and I spent eight and a half hours getting paid to have Sharon Stone run her fingers through my hair for eight and a half hours. <laughs> That's not a bad job. No. Yeah, not at all. It doesn't work for me. Since that was the last season of the practice, it went into syndication. So uh, I don't know if it was TNT or TBS was showing one episode a day five days a week. Uh, so every nine months, I'd get a little residual check. After 13 weeks, which is called a cycle, uh, you get, sometimes you get the residual fee as well as what's called a session fee, as though you shot it again. Hmm. Wow. Wow. You know, every, you know, nine weeks or so, I would get a nice little check that would help with the rent or, you know, buy me dinner or lunch or something. And then it sold overseas, and so I still get a little smattering checks here and there. With Twin Peaks, you're probably on maybe 30 seconds, maybe. Yeah, yeah. How long? How long were you were you there for the day, or how long were you on, uh, filming your your piece? Uh, I I was actually on set probably an hour, less than an hour, something like that. Mm. I'm trying to remember exactly when we shot that. It was like a year and a half ago, almost. Mm. Uh, but yeah, um, and they're really good at, and and I, I this is going to sound wrong, hiding stuff, because huh. all I saw in the bed was the body. They didn't have the head on the pillow. Ah. When I was when I was in the room, so when I saw the episode, I was like, oh, well, that's that's surprising. That that's interesting. <laughs> And I, I'm pretty sure that most of the actors in this particular series only get their scenes. And that happens with a lot of TV series, uh, especially ongoing, uh, because you don't always need to know what else is going on. Sometimes it helps for backstory. Did you get a script on Twin Peaks? Did you, would you, or did they just say, hey, okay, you stand here and take a picture? And <laughs> they usually stand here and take a picture, yeah. yeah. Um, there are, there are sets where there are, uh, the sides, which are like a miniaturized version of the script that can fit in a pocket. Hmm. And, uh, usually it's just the scene that's being shot that day. And I didn't see any of those. Uh, sometimes you get a call sheet. Sometimes you don't. Uh, I'm in the Screen Actors Guild. So technically, if I really kind of made a, a thing about it, I probably could have gotten a call sheet. I really don't try to be deeper or difficult to work with because mm. I like getting hired. <laughs> right, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I actually worked with somebody who was hired on something that they were bringing uh, us back to something. We had been day players, and they brought us back, and my co-partner in the scene apparently made a stink about getting a day player contract when technically it was kind of backgroundy, mm. and she uh, apparently I found out from, and I, I my actual calling service called me this time saying, uh, they want you as background, is that okay? I'm like, yeah, it's no problem, we'll, you know, hopefully maybe back as another day player, and the fact that I didn't make a stink, and my partner did, they said, well, the production really likes you, they really like you, they're probably going to use you again, but they're probably not going to use her. Oh. Oh. And I'm like, that's why I try and be very laid back and, uh, you know, ride the wind. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's too bad. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where, you, yeah, it's a tough thing because you want to be feel like you're being respected and understand what you get, but you also don't want to miss an opportunity yeah. to get another job and stuff. So, yeah. Did you yeah. um, ever watch the show? You know what you remind me of? Um, ever watch the show Ricky, uh, Ricky Gervais' Extras? I, I loved the first season. The second season was a little um, 
awkward because yeah. he went all diva when he became successful. Yes, right. yes. And I was like, oh, oh please never let that happen again. <laughs> to me, the best scene in that whole series was Ian McKellen describing how to be an actor. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that was just so brutal. And 90, like 80% of that was improv hmm. of yeah. that show. Yeah. They had like a scene and the, the actors were allowed to go off and be the sort of alternate universe version of themselves. I enjoyed the show a lot, and there are people I've seen like that, like in the first episode where you can see him actually slowly trying to move over to get into the shot. Yes, yes. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my God, I know people like that. Wow. I know I've seen people do, almost do that. <laughs> And the trick is you don't do it when the camera's running. You find out where the camera's going to be placed, and you make sure you're placed so you're already in the shot. Hmm. But uh, And that's the thing is if they ask you to do something extra uh, or, you know, bonus stuff, uh, you get what's called a bump. It could be $20. It could be $50. Uh, when I worked on Westworld, they asked, uh, and I was there for like two weeks working on just a pilot episode. They brought a bunch of us in, and they said, is anybody here willing to do nudity? Hmm. And of course, my hand goes up. And <laughs> I, well, it was like a three hundred dollar bump. Wow, wow, that is something. And what was uh, what was funny was they uh, they put me in a robe. They you know made made sure I was made up, and I was going to be one of the the robots sitting you know in the diagnostic section. But what was interesting was they had me in a robe and slippers all day. And they'd bring me to the sound stage, but not to the set. And then they'd bring me back to holding. And I spent the entire day that way. And they never used me for music at all, but they still paid me for it because wow. I'd agreed to it. Nice. Wow. You know, we'd already filled out the paperwork. Yeah, that works. Wow. Isn't that something? Good deal. Very good. <laughs> yeah. so, so were you ever yeah. able to talk to David Lynch at all? I mean, did he? Did he, he was very pleasant. He was very hands-on. He was on the set. He was making sure the camera was exactly where he wanted to go and he had you know and he made suggestions as to reactions and such there's a an additional shot that they shot of me that isn't in the episode where um when you see the me and the, the female medical examiner just standing there that shot actually opens with me slowly lowering the camera from my face Hmm. And I, oh my God, I can't believe this kind of a look. So the shot actually starts with the camera already at my waist. Oh, wow. But yeah, he was very pleasant. And when I was wrapped, he, you know, walked me down the hallway, very pleasant, shook my hand and all that. It was nice. very nice. It's awesome. And, uh, you know, it was like, oh, if there's any other kind of venue I could meet this man and get a photo with him, it'd be brilliant because <laughs> he's such a nice, affable guy. So you also do a, your own podcast, don't you? It's, it's the Paranormal View? We've never really called it a podcast. We call it a radio show, but ah. it is the Paranormal View. It's on para-x.com, and it airs uh, on the West Coast Live from 5 to 7 p.m. on the East Coast Live from uh, 8 to 10 p.m., and uh, it's international. We have people all around the world who listen to us. One of our co-hosts, Barbara Duncan, keeps track of, as to what countries are listening to us, and we announce that at one point during each show. Uh, Henry Foister, our main primary host, is in uh, Trenton, Ohio. So he goes to a lot of local haunted areas near him, like uh, Waverly Hills, uh, Gettysburg, and such like that. So I'm mm. looking for, I'm actually have a supporting role in an independent film being shot in September in Gettysburg, which is written by Craig Rupp, who was a former co-host of The Paranormal View. Huh. Uh, he and I became co-hosts at the same time in January of 2011. And about five or six months in, he had to move on to other stuff, and I've stayed on since then. Yeah, so I'll be going out to Gettysburg and hopefully staying in one of the haunted B&Bs and Craig is going to show me all the haunted places that he knows on the battlefield. And yeah, if you'll be out on the battlefield as it's getting to dusk and you'll hear gunfire and there are no oh recreationists out there. Isn't that something? Isn't yeah. That's that crazy. That is crazy. Wow. Well, Jeffrey, so, thank you so much for your time. It was. I think it's really yeah, interesting right. that, you know, I think always people are looking for, like, the number one star of, of a TV show or movie, something like that. I love to hear what the your story, yeah. the background, and yeah. things that we don't always know so I think you've educated me. I really appreciate you sharing, uh, you know, your work. 
And uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. How can people can people follow you? I know you're on Twitter. Yeah, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Real Badger. R E A L B A D G E R, like the little furry critter. And uh, I'm on Facebook. You can look me up, uh, actor Jeff Gould. That's spelled G E O F F, like Jeffrey Rush or Giraffe. G O U L D, like Elliot Gould. No relation. <laughs> I've met him, but we're not really good. Uh, so. Well, thank you so much, Jeffrey. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Anytime. Feel free. Thank you, Jeffrey Gould, for that awesome interview. The Life of an Extra. It's time to get into part five. And this originally aired June 4th, 2017. It's called Case Files. And I heard the title of this Case Files. It's like, oh, we're going to get into Cooper's Case Files. Wrong. <laughs> I was excited. I was like, oh, we're going to dive deep. Maybe Hawk is going to get into Cooper's files, and we are going to discover some stuff. A little bit. A little bit. You know, that title is very misleading. I will I will say this. I can speak for you, I'm sure, when I say we both are really enjoying this. We both love it, and we love talking about it. But this episode is the episode where not much happens, but a lot happens. Yes. And it's so hard to put that into words i here's what i think i feel like it clarifies things we've been wondering about maybe the characters about their abilities uh, specifically i'm thinking mr c mm. i feel like it's at least we're getting a little more clarification on what is going on here yeah and we're getting introduced to some new characters and i will say ben your theory that you brought up last week about how in the beginning we are outside of the town, and we're just getting snippets. But we're kind of in the middle. Dude, we got a lot of Twin Peaks in this episode. We did. I was very happy with that. It, it really switched back and forth a lot, um, more than we're used to in the last four, which is promising. So I, I feel you're, you hit the nail on the head with that theory, and I almost see it maybe by the last five episodes, we might be strictly in Twin Peaks and maybe somewhere else, but I would say 75% might be all Twin Peaks. And my theory has been the last nine, so we have 18 hours or parts, mm. and my theory is the last nine is strictly in Twin Peaks, and we've got our old Cooper back. That's what I think is going to happen. Now, are you like a lot of other people that are is getting tired of the Dougie? Let's, let's talk about this. Let's talk about Dougie right now. Yep. Um, I, I saw a chatter online that people are saying, I'm sick of the Dougie. I want my Cooper. Well, yeah. The, the well, where are you Dougie on that? Cooper, so we still we have we have Cooper pretending to be Dougie or is it, is living the life of Dougie. So I, but he's relearning life. Yeah. I'm, I'm on the fence. So I think Kyle McLaughlin is doing a fantastic job in this role. And I love, oh, no doubt. I love his performance. I love all the emotions he's going through. And I think it's great. But, but yeah, there's part of me is like, oh, he's still just standing there, and people have to push him along. And part of me is, I think I'm just excited and anxious to to get back to mm. the original Cooper. I think, I think if I wasn't so anxious, I would be enjoying it, and I am enjoying it. Yeah, Sabrina Sutherland, she's the executive producer of of the show. She has said that think of two hours as about ten to thirteen minutes of a movie. Yep. And if you can think of it like that, you can say, well, this is only a very small piece of the whole picture. Yes. If you think about it, the day, the uh, timeline of this, mm. Cooper wakes up and has breakfast. Or Dougie, I should say. Wakes up and has breakfast. I think it's Cooper, though. I think we should say Cooper because Dougie is gone to the Red Room is now a a a marble or a uh, golden whatever. I guess it's a tomato-tomato scenario. Yes. Okay. Anyways, I don't know yeah, what yeah, yeah. you were saying. Yeah, but – um. So it, that episode ends where he's going to work, and now this picks up. He's at work. Yep, so he, or he, get, he starts his day He starts with, his day. Going it, to work. Yeah, yeah, so, I mean, like, you're right. I mean, this is this just a blip in his life. Like, yeah. we're not getting much. In this episode, not much happened, but it was a connecting episode, I thought. It felt like it was um, bridges some gaps, right. gives us some new information, um, to move the story along, and I feel like the meat is going to be this coming Sunday, just I, like yep. your 
your thought about how one and two, one and uh, three and four were together. Yes. I always felt that second hour was the meat, mm-hmm. and we it's didn't get set, the meat. You, you had to set, set it up, up to then be able to give you the exactly. Line. Right, 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 yeah, right. yeah. This is a setup, definitely. So we start off in um, in Vegas. The most interesting part about the beginning is a woman on a BlackBerry. Mm-hmm. Okay, which oh, a BlackBerry. And kind of old school still, isn't it? Very. Like Black bears aren't even made anymore, but clearly this is an old one. And she's bruised. And I'm thinking, who who beat her up? She looks a little scared and uh, beaten. Yes. And she's very anxious. So the thing is, is that there's a conversation with the guys uh, who were, were trying to take out Dougie. That, yes. You know, he's, they've been going around his house and his car is still parked at the house. And so she's contacting him and saying, hey, you're supposed to get this job done. I th- believe, you know, you're supposed to kill him. Yeah. And, you know, they're still waiting for him to leave the house. And she's very anxious. Like, she wants this done now. I think, I feel like whoever she reports to will, I think will come it's down. Mr. C. Yeah. I mean, I my, feel like my, I, per- I, I agree. It's, Mr. it's probably C. Mr. C. She doesn't know Mr. But she did have bruises on her face. Yes. Which basically tells me if we, if this doesn't happen, Mr. C is going to take care of me. But she doesn't know that Mr. C is in jail. Right. So. And as we get to it, that doesn't matter if he's in jail, it seems. I oh, mean, he's yeah. got some power. I mean, got, we, yeah. Yeah. But she, so she, she she uses that Blackberry and she uses, I think she says urgent. Yeah. Well, it's funny, when I first saw that, for some reason my mind went to agent. Like if you mix the letters oh, a little bit. Oh, you I was read like, it so quickly. I read it so quickly it said I saw agent, but it says urgent. urgent. And she's contacting somebody. I think we learned at the end it's Buenos Aires. And if you remember, and, I, and this might be through the missing pieces, of course, that Je- Agent Jeffries was in Buenos, Buenos Aires. Aires. So yeah. I don't know. I mean, my first is like, is she contacting Agent Jeffries? Well, the interesting thing is, it's like a box. Well, yeah, right. It's some kind of box that has lights, though. Like, she sends the message, and then what we see is a box. Yeah, so let's, 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 let's. A small con- little box, black box. Yeah, let's connect this. Because we get this box again later in the episode, and we're going to just jump around. We can cut to Mr. C being in the prison, and he gets his phone call. Now, we know we know that um, Gordon says, give him his private phone call. Right. Wink, wink. wink. We're, and we're going to record this yes. and find out what he's doing. But yeah. Mr. C's not stupid. He he knows what this means. And what what is interesting, he goes, Mr. Strawberry wouldn't like who I'm going to call. And I, some- took, I took that as a reference to the Warren. That, like, the Warren? Yes. The Warren. I, th- yeah. I think he, he's got, he knows stuff about them. So basically that whole scene, I know we've jumped to the end of the, of the episode. It's fine. But it basically is basically saying, Mr. C is basically saying, I'm in control, and I can do whatever I want. If I want to take this whole prison down, I can I take can it do down, it. and I've got dirt on everybody. Yes. So don't mess with me. Because <laughs> if he were to call Mr. – if he were to call Mr. Strawberry – and the other guy, the guard, he doesn't know what's going on. It's being videotaped. The warden looks so, like, nervous. Like, oh, my God, what is this he going to do? Yes. And then he just dials the series of numbers that just uh, sets every iPhone off. Because <laughs> you hear the iPhone. Oh, yeah. yeah. All, everything goes crazy. And he says, what does he say, Ben? He says, the moon. I don't know He the says, the word. cow jumps over the moon. Yes, yes. And then everything stops. And I was like, what the hell just happened? To me, now, it just basically says, I've got the power, and I can, it don't, don't mess with me. But it goes back to that box. The box in the beginning of the episode. And the box disappears. I, it's funny. I didn't associate the uh, Mr. C with the box, but you are. Yes, because when he calls it, the box, it shows the box, and the box turns into another little um, stone thing. Yeah. I and couldn't tell like, if it was the same stone as the one that... It wasn't a gold stone. Right. It was just like a little rock. But I was like, what the frick is with the box? And why... So that woman sent the text to that box, and Cooper s- sent a message to that box. And that hmm. box disappeared like, uh, they're on to us. Something, you know, I got the indication that he's saying, they're on to us, you need to disappear. And the box disappears. That's the whole box. That to me, that's the whole box story. This episode. 
<laughs> it's the story of the box. I don't know. Uh, My theory is I don't. The glass box. It's a whole. It's a whole lip, it's a, a Palm of your hand. Look, it, it looks like a pager. Or yeah, I think it beeps and stuff like that. I don't get it. I feel like there's some kind of communication. I don't know why. Because I think one of Aries, I was thinking it had to do with Agent Jeffries. So that's what I thought. But it's I a also, good theory. I also thought the woman who was sending the message definitely was connected to Mister C. I mean, I think I feel I still mm-hmm. want to believe that these guys are supposed to kill Dougie. But John Thorne came out with a theory on on Twitter. To our stone. But his theory was that I think that Mr. C was manipulating everybody, and the stone was actually Dougie, mm-hmm. and like he turned into like a gold stone. But because he manipulated him to get into the red room, he's then kind of hoping to kill both Dougie and Cooper. Yes, and so I think. I maybe the whole idea was that he knew that Cooper would end up in Dougie's house, and then the assassin people would kill Cooper, and then that would kill Mr. Both. C would be able to stay in the real world. That, I mean, and that I was think, a loophole. That was his yes. way. Of, and, and he kind of said, you know, it goes back to that whole diner with Ray, and it's like I'm not afraid, I'm not concerned. I wonder if that was his plan. He he's not accounting for that now. Dougie is Mr. Magooing his way out of. Everything. Right. I mean, the reason he wasn't shot was because <laughs> Cooper drops his keys and looks down and he's able to get away with Jade. Now, let's go to the keys since you brought that up. The keys. You know what's weird, Ben? So I was looking when I was making my coffee. Yes. I, I make uh, the David Lynch coffee before every Sunday. I save it for Sunday uh, night. And man, does it keep me up all night. It's good. It is good. I it's had good. it just for the premiere. I still have some left. I, I do should, every night, every th- Sunday. This week I will go back to it because it was it – was, Probably the best coffee I ever had. I'm not a huge coffee drinker. I mean, I, I say it's, that every t- every time we have the show, I drink coffee. But it's like the smoothest coffee yes. I've ever had. It's really good coffee. It's damn fine coffee. Damn fine. <laughs> damn good. But I have the keychain that, you know, we were graciously given. And it's the keychain of Cooper's Key. key yes. Key from ring. Great Northern. Great Northern. And it's funny. I'm looking at it, right? And I flipped it over. And on the back, it says, if lost, Please mail, put a mailbox. Ours does say that. Yeah, and I was just like, hmm, I wonder if Cooper ever got his key back because we never saw it again. That last uh, Sunday night's episode, you see the uh, the woman of the night, the escort there. She was getting her car detailed, and the guy says— Yeah, Jade there, right? Yeah, he is like, Jade, uh, the guy says, hey, one of your Johns left this in your car. And I was like, holy smokes, there it is. <laughs> So she puts it in the mailbox. Who do you think is going to get this in the mail and is going to be like, that was Cooper's room? Only we'll we'll it, say it together. All right. Ready? Yep. One, two, two three. three. Audrey, Audrey Horn. Yes. <laughs> Audrey. Yes. And oh, here's here's why it's so perfect too. Is like you know she leaves Cooper a note in the second season, and he doesn't see it for a long time. But it's still kind of like that way of basically it's the same thing. It's kind of a little bit, right? She gets the key, and it'll mean something to her. And uh-huh. she'll be like, "This was Cooper's room. This is where I got naked in his bed." <laughs> <laughs> Do you think it's gonna play out almost the same way? The key's gonna come in to the Great Northern, uh, sit in the mail, uh. and it's gonna sit there for a while. It'll be the whole episode at least. Audrey oh. will walk by and the key will just be there. And it eventually, so I, is it Trudy? I think it might be Trudy. There's, there's a girl yes, there. Trudy, she yep. might be hanging on to it. And eventually she'll give it to Audrey. She'll be like, hey, I got this in the mail a couple days ago. <laughs> and she, Audrey will be like, I think she'll get it right away. Audrey's a smart girl and she. we know she works for the Great Northern. We know she probably still works there for her dad. Well, you know, the show surprises us. We, uh, you know, we got Mike and Mel- Mike Nelson in this episode. That does take us to Mike. Mike is now a business guy. He's yes. working at some little local shop somewhere. And so my prediction was wrong. He was not a coach of the football team. No, right? <laughs> no. He was a businessman. I think our conversation is perfect. This was weaves right into everything. He is talking to a young kid who clearly does not care about getting a job. He's messed sloppily. Um we find out that his application is horrible, and he just looks like a junkie. Well, later, Steven. Yeah, later on we get to see it's Stephen Burnett. I think it is Burnett. Um, who is dating Shelly's daughter? And we learned that way back in part one that it was like Shelly said that Becky Becky, Burnett. Becky was dating Stephen. So we did learn that Becky Shelly's daughter was dating a Stephen way back in part one. Yeah, Stephen is not 
Burnett. It's Becky Burnett. Is Shelly's daughter. She comes in and needs money, like seventy-two dollars. And poor Shelly. Shelly's still working the diner, which we predicted. But I wanted more for Shelly. I wanted her to be having her own clothing line or something. I don't know, something cool. Directing music videos, maybe. <laughs> she is in real life. She's still there. We get to see Norm. Norm. Oh, uh, you know that really. I, I put this on Twitter, but like that was my favorite moment Mine too. of the whole my episode. Heart. That episode. Yeah. First, the establishing shot of the Double R Diner. So you see, yeah. the, I mean, you see it remodeled a little bit, and it's yep. like, oh, the Double R. And then to see Norma, and it's like, oh. Yeah. It was so touching. It was so it was. great to see them. And then them come together, and kind of like the old days, where it's like, oh, we, you know, back in the old days, like, oh, we sure know how to pick them. And, and you, they're basically kind of making a reference, too, that, like, hey, we, we've made some bad judgments. We picked our, the bad guys, and yeah, now we, our kids are picking the bad guys. Right. Yeah. And... No, we're gonna say then. All I was gonna say, I'm sure you're gonna get there too. But it, like, they have that st- shot with Stephen and Becky in the car. Yes, it kind of reminds you of uh, of Shelly and Bobby, kind of in the pilot where they're yes. at the double R and they're backing away. It kind of just reminded me of back of the. You're day. right. Yeah. You're right. Except it's interesting because he was scared to go in there. He he was scared of them because as soon as they were looking at them, he's like, uh he freaked out. Well, he, I think that he knows that they don't like him, and yeah. he's, a, he's, a, he's not right for her in the sense that, like, he's doing drugs, and... He's getting her to do drugs. Right. And here's the thing. I'm like, is this the new Laura Palmer? Just because of her, her expression and looking up the sky. It that was very fire creepy. Yeah. Yes. Okay. It was an interesting shot. She went through, a mo- like, this, this uh, desperate... Pissed off, yes. To so just, many right? Just on top of the world, happy. Yeah, she went to almost like standoffish. I don't want to be around you, and then all of a sudden her emotions changed. She decided to do a coke, or I guess it's probably the new drug that they were talking about with Bobby there. That they, yeah, yeah. Who knows what it is? Bath salts or something? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But still, you're right. You were actually uh, text me, and you were saying how like, oh yeah, look how she's looking up at the yes. sky. It's so like Laura, Laura Palmer, Palmer from Firewalk with me. And I didn't know, think about it until you said that. But it's like, oh, it's so yes, right. They Laura, can... She's going that, down that same road Rope? that Laura Palmer went down. Figuratively and literally. Yeah. <laughs> um, Hopefully she doesn't meet Bob. Yeah, you know, but do we need... Here, here. I mean, let's go here. Do we need a murder in Twin Peaks to draw attention to the town again? I think so. I mean, I think that was... I, I feel like that was my prediction, or I think I've talked about it. I do feel like at some point... We need a murder in Laura. I mean, sorry, a murder in Twin Peaks. Because we have an unknown. We sort of know what's going on with the body in in Dakota, South Dakota. There. Yes, we should get to that. But we don't. But I'm. But I feel like Twin Peaks. There's something needs to happen, that's going to draw attention. I think that's the second half of this series. I think the second half is going to be a lot more Twin Peaks. We're going to have Cooper. We're gonna we're gonna be investigating the whole Laura Palmer thing. Mm. We got a lot going on. But for this, you know, you mentioned the body. So there's a scene where they they autopsy and we find a ring, which is Dougie's ring with his wife. I must have given to him. Yes, yes. And later on in that episode, I think we discover whose body it is, or maybe yeah. Do you, uh, yeah, whose body was it? Then? I think it's Major Briggs's body. Is that right? We found fingerprints that match. I think that's what we're, we've discovered here. Which I think other people have had this theory that it could have been Major Briggs, but is that what you got from the episode? Didn't they get fingerprints and then? Yeah, they were they were locked. Right by the government, and yes. and Major Briggs works for the government. or worked for the government and stuff. So I think if it hasn't, if it's they applied, haven't stated maybe. it out, it, it seems to me to be implied that that is Major Briggs. Did Major Briggs die twenty five years ago? I mean, that's another thing. Like, I it's hard. Yeah, to how think. would it be his body? I know there's a mystery that there's that ring. I think to kind of point the finger at Dougie, there was fingerprints all over the place, which. It's weird. We haven't seen Matthew Lillard's character again. We I don't know if we will. I think he was a pawn. He was a pawn. Yes. He he played his role. Right. Why why would a ring be in that body too? Like and why it's connected to Dougie? Well, to I think these are all put in place to get Dougie in trouble. Hmm. To ma- because okay, the ring is Dougie's. So guess what? Now these people are going to go after Dougie. So no matter what, right, Dougie's gonna... in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to talk about Dougie, or should we talk some more about Mr. C? Let's get into the one of the coolest scenes in this episode, 
uh, with Mr. C looking in the mirror. Yes. They did so a great job. They did a great job. We, I think we've been wondering, like, how are they going to bring Bob back? Is going to be played by another actor? What are they going to do? And we have a scene where Mr. C is in jail, and he looks at a mirror, and in the mirror he morphs to Frank Silva's face of Bob. You're still with me. Yeah. So it's funny, you know, Doppelganger says, you're still with me. And I think, and I, what does he say? Yeah, you're still with me. I think he says something like, that's good. That's good. And, like... It's almost like uh, checking up, making sure everything's Yeah, good. it's so complicated. Like, I feel like this is a reference really for the audience. Yeah. But yeah, are we yeah, saying yeah. that the doppelganger has its own personality separate from Bob? And I guess maybe that's what they're implying with all those flashbacks to show Bob and, and, and the doppelganger. But it's funny because I, sometimes I kind of think that it was just a shell and it's pure Bob all the time. And... This seems to imply that they're, they're maybe working together, but they're separate. I think we all thought that it was Bob that was r running things, yes. but it's good to actually finally see it. And I don't think we need to see Bob that much more. We know now that Mr. C is Bob, and he's running the show. And he's yeah. definitely manipulating things, and he knows things are going to happen before they happen. Like, he's, oh, it's dinner time, and he just knew that. And, like, I don't know if that's his brain scheming to figure out things to kind of manipulate everybody, or if he knows the future. All right. We got to talk about some side characters. Uh, um, we could talk about Frank Truman being on the phone with Harry Truman, which, yes. which is a nice touch. It's a nice touch, and he's, he's trying. He's getting updated on the tests and how Harry's doing. Yeah. It was, and it's interesting, he's in the Hawk's office. Like, I, I guess he really wants some privacy, and he, maybe he's thinking that, like, everybody will leave me alone if I'm in a different office, even though Lucy knows where he is. <laughs> Lucy knows everything. Yes. And it, this was an odd scene, but this harken, this kind of takes us back to the old Twin Peaks. The wife finds him and just complains about this busted to pipe in the house, and it doesn't add anything, but it's charming and it's, it's, it's sweet. Funny. It's and funny, and it's funny, and then you know, it is funny because he barely speaks, and then she just blows up on him, and it's like uh -huh. you're, you're, you know, I can't believe you, and she, and he's just like. But I kind of feel like this shows his personality, hmm. how laid back he is, because the last time we saw him, he had he's putting up with Lucy, and he's putting up with Andy, he's putting up with Wally, and yes. all this craziness, and you can tell he's just holding back. Right. And his wife, now you see his wife, and he's just kind of like, yeah, I'm, I, he just laid back. Like, You're I right. kind of feel like... And Harry, actually, I felt was kind of like that, too. Harry was pretty yeah. laid back, and he put up with a lot. And Until maybe he, that's, he got pushed over the edge. Yeah. Then he was on top of a bookcase. Yeah. So we, we're back to... Dougie. Cooper yeah. Dougie. Cooper Dougie, and, his, and he's getting ready for work, or he's leaving for work. I've been meaning to say something about Naomi Watts. Like, I think she's in the perfect role of this wife, because I think about her work in Mulholland Drive, and I think she's very good at kind of, like, talking to herself, basically. I think she's just very good at, like, just doing all this dialogue and, like, almost talking out loud and just... She she was good at that in Mulholland Drive, and I feel like that's what she kind of does here, too. Like, <laughs> Cooper doesn't get, give her a lot to work with, and yet she can keep the conversation going. Yeah. She keeps it... I think it's brilliant. I think uh, and somebody else doing it might not have done a, as good job as she does. But she, mm -hmm. I don't know, something about the way her voice is, the way she expresses herself, she can somehow make this whole thing believable. Yeah. I don't know. She, yeah. I think she's just brilliant. I've been meaning to I've been meaning to say how impressed I am with, with how she carries the scene because Kyle McLaughlin doesn't give her much to work with. And that's his role. I mean, that's his part. He's not. He's kind of out of it right yeah, now. But for yeah. her to carry this and keep it going and say, come on, Dougie, get in the car. And, I totally agree. Yeah. Get into the car. What do you get out of that scene where you have the little boy in the back of the van mm -hmm. looking very kind of He's sad. He, I think he feels like, like he's not paid attention to enough. And I think... Cooper sees that and he he feels bad that like this kid deserves better. He deserves to be treated better. And at least that's what I kind of took mm -hmm. out of it, that he I I mean I, he's sympathetic and he can see he can see, he can feel and see other things in uh, You're right. He can because we we saw him winning jackpots. We also see him in this episode seeing, calling out a liar. And I think he's very hypersensitive to emotion yeah. and mm. starts crying. Yeah. It was a very interesting scene. And I have a theory about all this, which I'm going to wait till the end. Okay. I have my theory about this family. Mm. Um, 
So I'll wait on that. Right. And this makes me think about the the, the across the street neighbors. And, and it's I think we kind of say this before, how like, I don't know, I, I almost feel like there's some kind of similarities. In, I mean, here's a mother who's not taking care of her child, and but she's a druggie. And then we have this other family who's not paying enough ch- attention to their son as yeah. well. I don't know. It's, but I did mean to say something about the across the street people. And I think a friend of ours, uh, Twin mm-hmm. Peaks, he mentioned this on Twitter. And I've been thinking about this, and I kind of shrug it off because I don't think it was anything. And But the fact that he mentioned this on Twitter, I feel like I have to say that it's possible our, the neighbors across the street are the grandmother and the, the, the grandson. You know our, our Shelfonts, Shelfonts, how they were always oh. they were always the neighbors. They were neighbors of Harold. Yes. They were the neighbors in Fire and Walk With Me in the trailer. And I question whether they could be – the spirits and stuff that that that's quite possible. Maybe. I mean, it, I know that's why I kind of shrugged it off because it seems so far out there. But I kind of feel like this whole neighborhood could be a supernatural. It's got the it's the same name as the the production company at the beginning of Twin Peaks that right. actually show. Yeah, but it's R R, which is like double R, or it's like Red Room. It's yes, an abbreviation. So I do wonder if like it are is it possible this is an area that Mr. C set up and. It could be supernatural. I, I mean, this is this could be a far reach, but I yeah, yeah. the fact that uh, Twin Peaks mentioned this made me think. You know what? Maybe I should just bring this up. That it's quite it's possible that that druggy uh, mom and her son are actually the grandmother and the grandson from uh, the series and Firewalk with Me. It seems I know it's a reach right now, but I kind of like the fact mm. that we're seeing them again. So we see them again in this in this episode where. <laughs> The sun sees a light, and it's really the bomb of the car, and he decides to go check it out. And then we got those troublemakers who come by, and they get blown up. And Interesting, because my theory goes with them, too. So I, okay. I'll wait, I'll wait. But I like that. That's interesting. And uh, um, it's also odd that the son from the drugged-up lady, she sees that Dougie, Dougie Love's car has been out there for a day now. And, she, you know, he had witnessed someone putting something underneath it, which was I thought was a tracker. Hmm. I know it was a bomb. Yeah. So the kid goes under there like he's gonna take it off. Right. Like almost like like he, he like he should do that. Like he right. knows, hey, something's weird. And those guys who've been driving around the block. I feel like this is another group of guys. These are another Yeah, totally different. I think they want yeah. to steal it yes. for parts. Right. They they notice that it's just been sitting there. Yep. And they just so happen to come at the same time. They shoot, kid, get out of here. They start the thing up, and it blows up. Mm. So that was not a tracker. It was a bomb, yep. which was crazy. And I think now that we have his car blew up, yes. his car blew up, his ring is in a dead body, and he's been acting odd for his family. Mm. The alarms are going to go off. Uh, for the authorities, maybe someone's gonna right. be showing up for Dougie. Like, right. you're under arrest. He's gonna be like Matthew Lillard all over again. Maybe. And you bring up you bring up the bomb of the car. It makes me wonder if Mr. C hired Jack to do that. So remember Jack who <laughs> smushes his face. Yeah. He he was he seemed like he was uh, planning a bomb on another car. Yes. They mentioned that. Yeah. Yep. So I wonder again this. They haven't actually said it yet, but it seems to me that Mr. C is orchestrating this whole thing. I think so. Yeah. I think he's the mastermind. Cooper gets dropped off at work. He's outside, and he runs into a statue, which I believe is a cowboy bronze statue with a gun, uh, pointing a gun out. And I literally thought David Bowie uh, pointing at Cooper and Firewalk with me, saying, do you know who this is? Yeah. You're not the only one thinking that. That's interesting. And then on Reddit, and I, I thought this. And I was just like, that's so interesting that it reminds me of that. Hmm. But I wasn't sold on it. Yes. I went on Reddit, and man, the credit goes out to the people of Reddit because they're like sleuths. They found an old movie David Bowie was in. Hmm. He had the hats with, uh, it was an army movie, I believe. He was a yeah. scout. And he had the, he literally the same outfit. Hmm. Come to find out, the statue was made for the show. The statue was not something pre-existing. Yeah, I looked for a little while. I spent I, I spent a long time. Maybe I spent 10 minutes researching it. It's like, Vegas, somewhere in this area, what is this statue? And so it's good to hear that yeah. this is a pre-made. So yeah. I firmly believe 
and I know a lot of people do, and, you know, this is just a theory, but I, I firmly believe that statue was based off that character David Bowie was in that movie. It's very similar. Mm-hmm. Very. I mean, too coincidentally. Yep. And him pointing that gun just, I'm sure others just brought back that memory of Bowie, point, of Jeffrey's pointing. Do you know who this yeah. is? And... Yeah, and the I'm shoes. Say, so I'm going on the other side and saying yeah, I don't think it is that. So I, no. I hear that theory and I can only I can see that. Mm-hmm. Here's what I think it is. I think it's just the fact that it's a lawman. It's a, he's a cowboy with a gun and he's mm-hmm. a lawman. And Cooper is a lawman. He's an FBI agent. And I I'm agent. Looking, yeah, agent. But and he is still, an agent. He's an agent, right? But he's also a lawman. He's a, he's a man of mm-hmm. law. Mm-hmm. And so I think I look at that as Cooper just looking at this figure saying, This is the man I was. And like mm. it's again trying yeah. to bring his memory back. And he's he he he, he oh. didn't use a gun a lot, but he he still like the fact that he sees that gun, it's like that's what I meant to do. I yeah. meant to be a lawman. So You're totally right. Because the whole this whole episode was a series of things that reminded reminded him of his past life. Uh, the coffee. Ah, the coffee. The again. coffee. You know? I love it. So yeah, he's like in the elevator, and there's a there's I don't know if it's a temp or somebody who was supposed to get coffee. Yes. And it's like, oh, you know, you've been out for days. I didn't know if you're gonna be here, so I didn't get you a coffee. And then he decides to give one of the, his uh, peers his coffee, and <laughs> Cooper Cooper drinks it like nurses it like a baby, yes. and just drinks that coffee and like coffee. He has a coffee moment. Then he is an agent. He is a um, insurance, insurance agent, a- agent. Uh, for now, Lucky Seven. Lucky insurance, Seven insurance, yes. Which Lucky Sevens? You know, he was gambling. He was winning. Right, with sevens. Were, uh, yep, the sevens. Sevens a big number with him right now. I thought he was a real estate agent because that house he was having sex with with Jade was not his house. Mm. That was a house on the market. So I thought he's a real estate agent. Just allowing himself to the perks of using other sure. empty homes for his like his little uh, escapades. Yeah, I don't know what the story is behind so that. So it could be insurance on houses. Hmm. Maybe he has to go check out the houses for insurance purposes. That, that makes perfect sense because they do get into the whole story of there was a house fire, and at first they thought it was crim- like was purposely uh, arson, and the guy. The guy say, "Oh no, 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 no! This is legit. This is legit." And Cooper, he sees a shadow. Uh, green, green lights green. flash near the guy's eyes, yeah. and he says, "You're a liar." liar. Right. Cool. And again, it seems like maybe the Black Lodge or the spirits are helping him. Maybe I think but, they're guiding him. Yeah, but this is very parallel to our our old Cooper. Like old Cooper, he was he was sh- first old Cooper. He was very good at gambling. Like he, I wish I I think I posted this on Twitter, but he used to always say like to. Uh, Truman, and he would say, oh, well, you know, I always get a, a huge investment back. I take the 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 FBI's money, and I'm able to make yes. lots of profit. I'm good at counting cards, 21 and all that. Yeah, yeah. So he's really smart when it came to ga- gambling, and he's very good at telling people. And here's a good intuition. E- intuition. A great example, the first time we meet Leo, he, you know, he, t- he asks him, hey, uh, Cooper says to Leo, did you know Laura Palmer? No. How well did you know her? I said I didn't. You're lying. Just like he did in this episode. He's like, you're lying. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah. And Leo's like, I guess I did meet her. Everybody knew her and stuff. But to me, I was like, it was like parallel. It was like an echo. It was like here we see Cooper where he's really on the ball and he says, you're a liar. Mm-hmm. And here we have Cooper who's kind of like trying to come back to the world. And it's maybe he's being guided to say, hey, you're a liar. And you're right. It's the same. They're sitting across from each other at a table, just like mm. the interrogation yeah. room. They're in like a conference room, just like in the original. And his boss, similar, looks like Gordon Cole. Gray hair, same kind of stature. Mm. Um, he's not yelling, but he's yelling at him because he's <laughs> calling out other agents for being liars. Yes. And you better get his act together or you could be gone. Right. And, and I keep thinking to myself, like, so this show, is. it seems like we're continuing. It's like, he's not going to be able to do this case files he's like they're get, this is what the, the whole title of this show is case i guess files. is is cooper getting case, case files, files for insurance yeah and i'm like, <laughs> yeah that was it like, he's not gonna go home and do all these case files and come back the next day it's like up oh, it's done so i don't know where this is going but you know he was fascinated by the statue's shoes that's how it ends with the credits rolling right yeah it was just weird it's just kind of and again i feel like it 
if if it was a two part, I mean, like if it mm. was if the two parts were put together, we never would have got that credit scene. You're right. You're it right. it would have just gone into the next part. Doctor Jacoby, Mister Amp. Mr. Amp, as in Amp, as in electricity, as in... <laughs> he has a podcast video cast. Yes. Which was kind of cool. <laughs> Maybe a little shout out to all the podcasters out there. Maybe. Or video casters that yes. talk about Twin Peaks. But now Jacoby has joined the ranks of us. Yes, he, he has. And he has a weekly show. And he, I feel like he's taken the place of Invitation to Love. Nobody's watching Invitation to Love now. Now everybody's watching his show. On their it, phones. <laughs> on their tablet. Yes. You have uh, Jerry, and you have we get to finally see Nadine. Yes, I wish we saw more of Nadine. I know, but at least you seem like she's really loving this. Like, she's yeah. eating oh, this, this is, up. Like, yeah, I'm yeah, sure yeah. she has, like, five shovels at home because you never can dig enough shit out. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay, expectations were high on this. I'm not going to lie. So I see the shovels. We see him spray paint him gold. Now, in this episode, you see him... You know he's he's raging against the machine, man. He is he is off the deep. He's out the reservation. Mm. Um, the shit has gotten too deep. You got to get out of the sheet, and it's an infomercial for him to sell a gold shovel to people. Yep. So he can make some money. I don't know. Was it twenty nine ninety five? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. even know. He bought but, these shovels in bulk. The funny thing is that it makes me think of how he was actually twenty five years ago. Twenty five years ago, he didn't care about people really as a doctor, and he kind of in a way he's almost scamming them. It was kind of like. Yeah. And even, like, you, you, you think about Bobby, like, he was just getting information that he wanted to know more about Laura Palmer. So in some ways, you, you think people change, and you wonder if he, he really hasn't changed. Like, he's really he, – he sees that people are gullible Angry enough. And mad. Or, and mad. Right, they're mad enough. And I – at first I was like, oh, he's one of those crazy <laughs> – Conspiracies? Conspiracy. He kind of is. Kind of is. Yeah. Because he's telling people the stuff you eat is garbage, man. And, and, I mean, some of it's true, but I mean, it's still kind of out yeah. there. And then he, you have a little hand, and I think Mark Frost <laughs> mentioned the I little hand. I was going to mention this. All right. Mark Frost tweeted, did you see the little hand? And a lot of people made reference to our current president. So yes. that was interesting. Yes. That yes. was really fun. Oh. So that was kind of a cool little nod. Um, but in my head, in my head, I pictured him with those shovels, doing something more productive. You wanted him to do something else. It's funny. I mean, I don't even think we talked about this. I wondered if he was going to be like, oh, he does it for um, excavating the land, looking for something, right? Or maybe they had the like cave. these press conferences where you, you're 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 building a new place and you need a gold shovel to look like. I don't know for press up. Mm, mm, good point. That's a, I didn't but think I about mean, that. But yeah, yeah. But I mean, so that that's the end of that story. Probably yeah. we now no. know what the shovels were for. But let me say, I wasn't disappointed by it. I was just thrown off. I guess my expectations were just a little bit different from what I got. But I wasn't disappointed. And that's typical Twin Peaks, though, isn't yes, it? I mean, it is. the, we have expectations, and they don't always give us what we think we want. Yeah. So I like that. Now. Let's talk about the biggest. I think we've hit upon all the main things, but let's talk about the ending, Ben. This ending. I don't want to go deep into what is being said online about the ending. Um, I want. I, I want to talk about it at face value. And um, what are we talking about? The ending. The, the, we're talking about. We're not talking the about new, the statue. The new character we meet. Oh, at the double, the new, at the, the, at yes. the uh, roadhouse. Um, and he is an asshole. You know, he's a jerk. Richard uh, Horn. We meet yes, Richard uh, Horn. We didn't know that was his name. I don't think we knew it was Horn unless we saw the credits. Yes. Right. It was Richard Horn. He, interestingly enough, someone did point out the similarity of him smoking a cigarette looked very similar to Audrey Horn. Hmm. Just like, the, just like with Becky and Laura you know, all these similarities. And do we think this is Audrey Horn's kid? Do we think this is a uh, someone else's kid in the Horn family? I mean, I was trying to think. It was like Jerry's kid? Uh, is it Johnny's kid? Johnny's kid. That would be funny. Yeah. yeah. I I do kind of feel like it has to be Audrey's kid. I feel like because of the age, this is almost like Twin Peaks, the next generation. I feel like all of our people that we knew are having kids. Like... Or at least a lot of them. I mean, sh sh no, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I don't even know that for sure, but I feel like that's what we're gonna learn that they all have kids now. So it kind of makes sense. I I kind of feel bad that like, well, Shelly, well, I'm gonna talk about Shelly just briefly. 
in the credits, it only is Shelly. She yes. doesn't have a last name, and we don't know her daughter is probably not. We know it's probably not Bobby. Hmm, because she, of her last name. Yeah, th- th- they're keeping the last name a secret. So I don't think we're going to see her last name in the credits until they introduce who her husband is or who that right. kid is related to. Right. They're going to keep it a secret, which I like. That's really cool. Was there another Burnett that we learned? I thought there might be another. Was there? Maybe not. No, I, Becky Burnett. Steven is Becky's boyfriend. Yes. Oh, he, okay. And his last name is Burnett. So Steven and Becky both have the same last name? No, but why do they have the same last name is my question. This is, this is like, weird, huh? It's very weird, right? Because they're dating, and Shelly says that she doesn't like her, boy, his, her boyfriend. So maybe it's a red herring. Maybe Becky is not a Burnett. What if Shelly was married to someone, they had a son, she had a daughter, they got married, they got a divorce. They're like step... They're step, step brother. Well, sister. they were once. They're not related. Uh, Stranger Things c- could happen, I guess. I don't know. But they literally have the same last name. But I like this. We're cracking, we're cracking the code right here. I don't know if I want to believe it's Audrey Horn's kid. But he is a jerk. Like, he definitely, like, he's smoking where it clearly says no smoking. And then there's some girls that seem like they might be interested in him. And then they well, come by and talk, just talk and yeah. chill, chill out and stuff. And he grabs them and it, very inappropriately. And he's just he's just a jerk. Uh, yeah. And this caused some stir online. A lot of stir about this scene. A lot of people don't like him. And now, clearly, he's a bad egg. You want the audience not to like him. It was disturbing, and it was like, wow. And I thought about old Twin Peaks, where you had James singing with the girls, <laughs> and then it lulls you into this comfort zone, mm. and then Bob comes after Maddie, and yeah. it just takes you out. kind of felt like this was almost going on five hours of this comfort hmm. food, and then all of a sudden it uh, David Lynch hit us over the head with the Bob, this bad apple, really taking us back because did not expect that. Well, we, we I mean, yeah, in this roadhouse, we get two bad guys in here, but right, the idea that we kind of have like a Leo. I feel like we're kind of bringing up like this is the drug people yeah. that are running the drugs. Yeah. Uh, the cop... One of the, like, I think he's kind of a bad cop from uh, the police station. He comes in and says, oh, I'll talk with him and mm-hmm. stuff. And you, you learn that he says, hey, you can have the whole c- cigarette, cigarette pack, bo- pack yeah. and there's money in it. And it clearly seems to be linked to drugs. I think this is how they're getting drugs. I wonder if Bobby knows about this since he's working and this is a police officer and Bob Bobby's a police you officer. You think Bobby's bad? He's in on it? I don't think he's in on it. I no. think he does. What? It's Bobby's making money. Bobby's a good guy. It's interesting. He has cameras. <laughs> he's always been a good guy. No, but he has cameras. Yes. And somehow they're not capturing what they need to capture because he knows the drugs might be coming a different way. Interesting. Yeah, well, I this, remember that. This yeah. ba- okay, let's pretend that Bobby's a good cop. And this guy knows about Bobby's cameras. So they know what not to do. Right. There you go. I think that's more. That's more plausible. Well, yeah. Bobby could could have that little itch to make money on the side. Mm-hmm. We know he's money hungry. He's been money hungry when he was younger. Right. This could be a good way to make money. Uh, it's possible. It's possible. Yeah. I want. I I've been meaning to mention also there was a character named Toad in the Double R. Yes. And there was actually uh, there used to be a Toad. Yes. A, a different Toad. A different Toad. But this is Toad Junior. <laughs> toad Junior. Actually, Kevin Young Senior was an actor who was a big guy, and I think he had a tr- like a trucker hat. Or yeah, something like that. yeah. And he yeah. would just hang out and eat. Yeah. He's like, oh Toad, you got to get out of here. Get out of here, Toad. Yeah. And then there was another actor who I think his scene got cut. Uh, in Fire Walk with Me, Marvin uh, Rosend, and he is playing Toad in the series here. And I think he passed away maybe some time ago, maybe in the last year or something like that. But it's interesting. They were kind of, I feel like they were honoring the old Toad by having another character named Toad. Toad. That was really cool. Yeah. I did like that. So, Ben, I think we hit upon mostly everything. And uh, I do want to remind people the week 
Twin Peaks takes off, we are definitely going to hit upon everything that we've missed. Yeah, we'll get it more into. I think we'll we'll, we'll, the we'll get into more theories. Stuff. I also want to, you know, we didn't get into it last week, and I cheated when I edited and I added in the whole clip of Albert saying, "Hey, I, there's a woman that we got we got to have look at Cooper, uh, Mr. C, and mm. see is this really the real Cooper." And then what I did is I added in. Uh, Diane uh, Cooper uh, when D- Cooper got shot he says Diane yeah. so my theory is that Albert is going to see Diane I I'm warmed up to that theory cuz I think Audrey's going to be introduced with the key and Yeah that, I like that theory The key's like in place I think Audrey with the key and I think Diane's going to be um someone they need to talk to right. because she is connected to Cooper more than anybody mm. else So I have a theory about something. I feel like we might try to end the shows off with a theory or two if we have them. And um, this theory goes to the family, Ben. I think you'll find this very interesting. So I think Dougie's wife is hired. I think that... Hired? I don't... By Mr. C? Mm-hmm. Oh, no. So I think that she is hired by Mr. C to um, move Dougie along, to keep Dougie happy, hmm. to keep him in place. Hmm. Th- because I find it very alarming. She doesn't... Yeah, she's getting aggravated at him, but she's not... Did you have a stroke or something? What's right. wrong with you? Well, here's the thing. You know? I just want to cut you off. There was part in the car where she says, are you having another episode? So I do feel like... The real Dougie has had some issues in the past. Yes. She actually says that. Have, are you yeah, having yeah. another one of your episodes? Yeah. So I mean, that's my only counter to that. That like he. There's... No, no. I I think she's been with him a while. Um, I think she came with that kid. And here's 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 the wrench. Here's my wrench. The big one in the theory. I think she was hired by Mister C. I think she met him at the casino or someplace that she, he he like to hang out. Mm-hmm. They got married. Uh, um, I think because he was a bigger guy or something, maybe he just didn't have the luck with the ladies. Yeah. And she came along. I mean... But Mr. C has planted these this family. And in some ways it makes sense because if he's manufactured, if Dougie's manufactured, I really believe he was manufactured as a grown-up. It wasn't yes. like he started off as a baby. You're right. Because like that would be... Tw- I mean, if, if we're thinking as a human usually grows, they grow, he'd only be 25 years old or exactly. something like that. Yeah. And clearly he has this family. Right. Now here's my other theory to go along with this. The kid was with her as a plant. The kid is not really hers. It's not really Dougie's. Hmm. It, when he met her, she had the kid, and that came with the package. At Dougie, he saw, oh, this woman, and I'll, I can help them out, and I fe- and he falls in love, yada, yada, yada. That kid, that kid's real mom is the drugged-up mom across the street. Aww. I think those two kids are brothers, and I think when he was looking, when... He had a birthday. The mom, you missed your son's birthday. Mm. Well, it's interesting that there was a, a red balloon and balloons, and then in the druggies house there was one red balloon. Yeah. And I think that mom had like they were twins. <laughs> no, no, was celebrating his birthday, uh, but he wasn't there. Interesting. And I think she got messed up. I think Mr. C is giving her drugs to keep her messed up. To keep quiet. Hmm. He's a junkie. Yep. I can use your kid. I'll keep feeding you drugs or money. You let me use your kid. I'll give your kid a good home. Then she says 119. That kid had a big one on his shirt. Yes, he did. I think the other kid's the other one. Wow. Two kids. She's a nine? She's a nine. <laughs> yeah. Well, That's she would be a nine if she wasn't drugged up. Um, I'd like to bring up the 119. Again, if we're going with this theory that's backwards for nine one one, and that's where like again these people are from the red room. So I'm I'm going with this supernatural element that maybe this whole complex is supernatural, and they have the sign the Sycamore Trees. There's no, it's, it's just called Sycamore Lane or yeah, whatever it yeah. is. So I keep thinking, I wonder if this is. <laughs> I think it's all manufactured by Mr. C. I think mm-hmm. Mr. C uh, orchestrated a lot of this, but I, I that's my theory about this family. I think she was celebrating the. The birthday of her missing child with a 
with that pathetic red balloon, and she's just drugged up, That's trying to maybe forget about it. Maybe like I lost my kid, and I think the kid is looking depressed because he probably misses his mom mm. and he misses his brother, and he looks sad. And here's here's um, evidence. Here's where I, I'm gonna uh, say, uh, kind of back up what I'm saying here. You don't hear the little boy say dad. You don't nope. say the little boy say nope. anything. The little boy was playful with him, sort of like a kid would, like laughing. Yes. But never said, Dad, how's, you know, where were you, Dad? Or um, anything. This yeah. kid's very quiet. What if he is manufactured and it's another Dougie? <laughs> yeah, maybe. But that's no, what I'm kidding, saying. Yeah. I think it's a manufactured family. I, I, I think it's a fake it, family. You know, your theory is growing on me. I can I can almost buy this because I do see Mr. C is orchestrating a lot of this. I could yeah. I could buy this. I could see, and it would make more sense why the wife is understanding with him. But yeah, it is weird because when he goes to work, they're not understanding. They're kind of pissed off. Yep. Where the wife just seems so. Well, she also um, got a lot of money. She seems like he's, you know. She seems very greedy about that money. Like, there's something going on with well, that money. Well, that money, I mean, it's it, it basically they own money. So I think she was really worried that, that you know, they were in a lot of trouble. And it's funny that, you know, said, make sure you, she says to Cooper there, make sure you call. And, of course, he's not going to call. Yeah. So, I mean, he's still. Yeah, it's very weird. So that, that's my theory. Yep. That's my theory about that family. So. And I, you know the, that those troublemaker boys. One of them is Riley Lynch, which is David Lynch's son too. So he's playing a, guitar in that band. Oh, was he? Yes. Oh, trouble. Yes. yes he was so playing. then I'm wrong. Then maybe it's the band Trouble. That's the band that uh, they uh, the, the they were playing in the middle, I believe, of the episode. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not at the end, in the middle of Roadhouse or. Yeah. What, yeah. You know, when I saw the Roadhouse, I'm like, we're at the end already. And then it went on. Yes. yes. Uh, I was very happy. I know. I was saying that to my wife, too. I was like, no, no. it can't be over already. Yeah. Yeah. They trained uh, us. Well, I think, you know, we hit a lot about part five. If we missed anything, you can please send us a message at twinpeaksunwrapped.gmail.com. Let us know what you think. Um, but before we go, we have one more interview. All right. We're on the phone with Galen George. Hi, Galen. Hello. So you are a dancer and you're an actress, and we know you best as uh, from Twin Peaks as Nancy O'Reilly. And what was your what was your experience like working on Twin Peaks? I really enjoyed myself. I had a great time because I had already seen the show a little bit before I had gotten when I was on it, and mm. I love any I love I've always loved shows that have that mystery component to them. You know mm. that. And it was so, because of Mr. Lynch, David Lynch and Mark Frost and, and the way, you know, they like to tell stories. Mm -hmm. it, it was just intriguing to me because I love that mystery aspect. And, you know, the show is just so different and so yeah. cutting edge. So I was thrilled, you know. I, I, I had a great time on set. Episode 8 would be the season premiere of the second season. You're actually credited as being in that episode, but you weren't in the episode. And it was directed by David Lynch. I was curious if you actually did um, sh shoot that. Like, it would have been a scene between Audrey and you. I think, it would, yeah. do you remember if you actually did film a scene with... with I, you know what, now that you're mine, I think we did shoot that. That's, I did. I think we did shoot that, and that happens a lot. You'll hmm. shoot, it's like, I just was on an episode of Colony, and I didn't, well, I am in the episode, it's just they cut out, cut out all of my dialogue. Yeah. Um, but that can happen, you know, you can shoot. And I, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure we did shoot that scene. I need to look in my storage and I have, because I have all my scripts yeah. from um, past episodes. But I, because I remember working with David and I, maybe that, I do remember something about that. I think we did shoot that. Yeah, I think Audrey was playing solitaire and you were just kind of hanging out or uh, the, Nancy was hanging out. But the thing is that Nancy seemed a little bit more timid and a little bit shy. And it isn't until the end of the scene that, she reveals her name is Nancy. So, it, first of all, it doesn't seem, it seems out of character for everything else that Nancy became, and maybe even out of character from you, because you seem like a very lively, very outgoing, outgoing person. Yeah. And I don't know if, if that really even fits with, yeah, with the story, but I don't know. It, yeah, it's so funny. <laughs> I always get cast in these. I like playing characters that are completely different from me or that mm. um, bring out this, you know, it's just fun. It's like, um, it's like being a kid. It's like playing make-believe, you know, and playing these different characters. And 
and and it's always of course I, you know I always love what my costumes are and I like mm-hmm. the costumes and I saw a picture from the episode recently somebody sent me and I was looking at it and even appreciating it more now because the costumes and the way they did my hair and the whole look and uh, yeah it was yeah it was very cool so, yeah and it's funny so you only I think that, so there's really only two episodes that you, that we get, we got to see you in but I loved your character and I actually wanted more of that kind of like. Uh, more of the story of between you and your sister Blackie, because there's definitely some kind yeah. of rivalry going on. They don't go into it. They don't. They go yeah. into a little bit. Basically, Blackie is like, I don't want her here. Yeah, yet. that's <laughs> it. But, but I mean, I wish it went yeah. further. Yeah. And, and what was it like? I I agree. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> And what was it like for you working with these uh, actors? How how was the relationship with them? Well, you know what what I always like. You know, it's like. You know, for me, when when we're when we're working on a scene, okay, Kyle and Sherilyn, they were you know they were the stars of the episode, especially Kyle, such a mm. well known you know well known. But when we're on set, the way I've been told, you know, we're all artists, and we come together as mm. artists to create a scene that it's about the scene and the storytelling. So the thing that was great, especially you know Kyle and Sherilyn, they were so welcoming. You know, I mm. love when I'm a guest star and I'm coming onto a show and they're welcoming, and then it just it drops all kind of uncomfortable feeling. Welcome you. You start working on the scene. And so that's, they were just sweet and, and kind. And we had a great time. It was, I, I enjoyed myself because they were so open and warm, you know? Yeah. And what was it like, um, Michael Parks? What was it like working with him? Uh, Jean <laughs> Rene. Rene yeah. Ronald. What a great actor. I know. <laughs> Because I remember, you know, we're sitting there and we're just kind of casually talking and then the cameras roll and we go into this, you know, into this scene and we're, you know, kind of a little bit seedy and, mm. and, um, it, it was fun. It was easy, you know, it was easy to work with someone. I mean, you, you do these kind of intimate scenes with somebody that you don't know very well, mm. but when it's, you know, he's, and you just have to be intimate right away in a way, but he was such a professional and just so much fun. I just remember he and I kind of having fun with it, you know, yeah. because, you know, when he takes the knife and then my, you know, my stockings and the whole thing, it, it was, yeah, he he was, we had a lot of fun. I mean, I, I definitely did. And he was such a professional, such an artist, you know. Yeah, he's, he, it, it's a shame his character didn't go further. Because right. he, he was a great villain in Twin Peaks. Yeah. He really was. Yeah. And I actually want to see more yeah. of you, though, because, like, you, you, you well, we'll get there. There's a, one more scene between you and Cooper, and then you're never seen again. And... Uh, Jean's uh, scene, he he continues on a little yeah, bit further, yeah, and yeah. then we don't know what happens yeah. to you. So it would have been neat if you, if you had gone on with him. Yeah, to, but like his little uh, like a henchman assistant. assistant. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. but one I probably one of the most memorable or um, I always kind of like I don't know I cringe at. But there's a scene between you and Cooper, or, or yeah, there's the scene where you, you have the knife. Nancy yeah. has a knife and you're about to stab Cooper and Cooper comes in and basically punches you in the gut. I mean, I'm always like, ah, oh, I can't believe he just <laughs> beat uh, <laughs> oh. what was I it? know. Oh. What was it like doing that? Did you have to um did you have to block that out and figure out how the best to do this? Yeah, scene? we definitely had to block that out because you know when you do any kind of fight or any kind of uh, scene like that, you gotta do some we have to do some blocking mm. and I mean, even though it's television, so we're, you know, kind of moving fast, but it definitely was blocked out. And, and since I'm my background as a dancer, you know, I had to get, kind of contract my body. Mm. So, and he hits me against the wall. And the thing that's funny is I posted a picture of that scene because somebody sent me these images from the episode. Mm. So I posted a picture on Twitter of, of Kyle, you know, when he has his arm back and I'm, you know, back behind the wall right before he punches me. And I posted that on Twitter. And, oh, my gosh, people went crazy over it. <laughs> um, yeah, there was a few directors you had. One of them was Linka Gladder. Do you remember working with her as, as the director? Yeah, it, you know, it, I like, you know, each, working with each director. Everybody has a different perspective of how they want to tell the story. Mm. And I just remember... Um, just a, you know, there was like a, there was a sensitivity to each character, no matter how small my role was or how big anybody else's role. Every character was a part of the story, and I just mm. remember that being integral to, um, because it all makes the whole. It, it all is part of. It's another color into the painting. I appreciated her sensitivity into what uh, what my character was bringing to the the storyline too. So I, I just remember her sensitivity. Do you remember how you got the part to play Nancy for Twin Peaks? Do- I imagine you had an audition. I don't know if you had an audition for Mark Frost or David Lynch. Or 
I, I auditioned. I know the casting director was Joanna Ray, and mm. I know she's involved with the Joanna Ray is involved with the new Twin Peaks. Joanna Ray cast me in quite a few different things, mm. but I remember auditioning. Maybe Mark Frost was there. I don't remember who was it when I auditioned and read, but I just read and auditioned for it. And I, but I know it was Joanna Ray cast, and she called me in. Now, are you watching the season three of Twin Peaks? I haven't watched it yet. I've got them on hold to watch. I'm sitting where, waiting because I've been so busy, so I'm not disturbed, so I can sit and just um, I can just focus on it. But I keep hearing from everybody that I know and friends and stuff saying, "Oh, you got to watch! You got to mm. watch!" Stay it's, offline. I keep hearing all these incredible things. <laughs> you, it's going to get ruined. Don't go on Twitter. <laughs> it's like I can't look, or they're going to people are going to blow it from me for it. Me, you know, yeah. I got. I said, "Don't tell me! Don't tell me! I got to watch it on my own." Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're you're in for a treat. You're in for that's, sure. that's what I keep hearing. Yeah. That's what I keep hearing. <laughs> so when you were done with Twin Peaks, you, you actually got a part in Storyville, which is Mark Frost's uh, directed uh, film. How did that come about? Yeah, I think he called me in for that, and I remember um, reading for that. And one of the, I remember kind of going through some reading for that, and one of the main reasons was that I had to do this accent because mm. the, the story takes place in New Orleans, huh. or as my character, my character would have said, Nol and Nol, and <laughs> so I had to get this. I had to get this particular accent, and so that was something that he was really wanting to be spot on. So I kind of had to go through a little bit of auditioning to get the accent right. And I, he, he hired me, and oh my gosh, I, oh, I had a blast. <laughs> I loved, oh, I love shooting down there and working with everybody and being, oh, I just, and it was so much fun, that character, and I'm sitting in the courtroom, and she's got yeah. this attitude, oh. Yeah, I was so watching it. It's like, again, I wanted more of you. Like I was, <laughs> I, I was watching the courtroom scenes. Like, okay, let, let, let's get more. Let's go behind the scenes of that. But yeah, what, what, I like you. I like the way you think. <laughs> yeah. It was so good, though. It was awesome. Uh, Mr. Frost and Mr. Lynch, if you listen in, you hear that? You hear yep. that? <laughs> bring it back. If we have another season of Twin, Twin Peaks, Peaks, we should bring you back. I know. I yeah. agree. I agree. I, I and I have quite a few people that are saying that. There's quite a few people are saying that. Awesome. Are you dancing now? Or are you still you're still acting? I know Colony. You were talking about like what is your what are you interested in right now? Well, yeah, I am. I have been. Of course, I always dance because I'm a dancer. But I've been doing. I've done quite a few in the last few months. I've done um, some television movies, um, some parts on some television movies, and did Colony. And what I really want to do is uh, character work because I do a lot of improv and I do mm. a lot of comedy but I do all these characters with all these different accents and all these characters so I really want to do some character stuff that it would be great to come back on Twin Peaks and and have you know a rich character because that's what I being a character actress that's yeah. to me where the fun the fun that's the fun right now definitely so, uh-huh. That's, That's what awesome. I'm definitely interested in. Yeah. That'd be yeah. cool. I hope yeah. that happens. That would be really cool. I know. Come on. Mm -hmm. I'll have to message I'll have to message Mr. Frost. Mr. Frost. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much for your time. I mean, it's been so yeah. we we've had such a good time talking with you and uh, we really enjoyed your character on Twin Peaks and and we'll so. get you back on. We'll start a hashtag campaign. <laughs> And we'll, we'll send that it to him. That sounds Mark good, you guys. Oh. That sounds good. I, I'm going to message Mark Frost. Hey, <laughs> Mark Frost. I'm going to message him. Hey. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and everyone follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. My first name, G-A-L-Y-N-G-O-R-G. -G Thank you, guys. Have a great, great one. Thank you, Galen, for your time. Awesome. I think it was an awesome show, Ben. Yeah, it's awesome. We got a few actors that, from Twin Peaks. Yeah, so cool. We got into some theories. It's. I mean, I can't wait for next week. I can't wait to see what part, happens next. Part six can't come soon enough. Right. And every time we think we got a good theory going, it gets blown out of the water. But I like the dynamic we have going right now, Ben. I like how we're the yin to the yang. You're my yin to my yang because you go the supernatural <laughs> route and I go the more grounded route. But in Lynchland, everything is possible. Anything is possible. Brian, you're my Mark Frost, and I'm the David Lynch. Lynch. Yes, it's so true. It's so true. I want to thank everybody who posted on our Facebook page. I know this episode is running long. I'm I'm probably not going to have time to re, uh, spout out some uh, comments. But every Sunday after the show, I'm going to post a picture, and we're going to continue the dialogue about what you thought. And I think everybody who posted it, uh, it was awesome. Everybody had the theories, and, you know, I'll try to interact with people, but I, I love the conversation that continues. Uh, today's episode just going too long. We're not going to do it. Uh, we'll save it for next week. 
But if you have a comment, a question, or a theory, twinpeaksunwrapped at gmail.com. Ben, you got the Twitter. What's going on? The Twitter is blown up. I love the Twitter. <laughs> now, there's a lot of great theories and a lot of great conversations happening. And I'm always, like, you know, we mentioned uh, Twin Pete's. It was cool that with him talking about the neighbors. And I think there's always a lot of great theories happening. And a lot of so just great many. friends, yeah. other podcasts, and what they have to say. And we're all bringing so much to the table. And I just love the community. Yeah, the community's been great. And, you know, listening to Diane's podcast and Deer Meadow and – the Red Room and Brad Dukes and all those Sparkling guys. Sparkling 21. Sparkling. Good old Sparkling 21. It, you know, it's so crazy the amount of information we get in that week. And I try my best to kind of, um, until we record, I don't want to listen to anything because I want to have my own opinion. Me too. And it's tough because I love hearing everybody else's, but I'm trying my best. And I have to say the Twin Peaks community on Reddit amazing they just dig on things it's great it's great you can find us on facebook we're over 700 likes my next goal is 750 i think we can do that twin peaks unwrapped on facebook and we're on the tumblr we're now on google play we have now been submitted and now we're officially in google play ben awesome how cool is that that's so cool. And I know we've been having some issues with iTunes. I'm hoping this week we're going to be back. Yes. And yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, I'll put it this way. If you subscribe to us, subscribe to us on iTunes. You'll never miss a show. If you go to look for our show, we were just having some issues about it. Sh the newest one showing right. up in the downloads. And, yeah. And, and I always, very weird. On my pod, my pod app that I get, it always works. works. And, and I have no problems. But for some reason, it just wasn't showing up on iTunes. And of course, it happened right when the new series started. I we, know. We never had, an issue. <laughs> two years we've been doing this show, and we never had an issue. Uh, and, uh, but that's all good. Yeah. It's all good. It seems to be working now. But, you know, if you have a problem, let us know. And we're on Stitcher. Uh, there's so many ways you can listen to us. TwinPeaksUnwrapped.com. You can find all our shows right there. Oh, yeah. A and good shows. every Friday, uh, we have been posting our newest episode on YouTube. Yeah. A few days after we posted uh, on our uh, on our website and on iTunes, then we put it up on YouTube. Yeah. There's a whole community right there. Yeah. We're getting new subscribers every day. It's wonderful. Yeah. It's so awesome. So thank you to everyone, and I can't wait to see you all next week.